Okay. Um, last class, message of the prophets, final exam. And as I, I don't always say this, but if you've missed any of the classes, if you're taking this for credit for either degree or certificate, you're only allowed to miss one class a term. If you've missed more than one class, or if you missed even one class, you want to make it up. All of the videos and the materials, the PowerPoints, etc., are all online at litchapala.org. It stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology, litchapala.org. I know most of you have already, you know, accessed that and use it. The study notes are there and everything else, but I encourage you to do that if you missed anything. Plus, if you came into this just this term, there's three previous terms with three classes in each term, so there's nine other courses that you can take online if you care to do that. All right, today we're going to be talking about the message of the prophets, particularly as related to eschatology. I'm sorry if that's running off the top up there, but that's the best I can do here. Um, eschatology and the message of the prophets. When we talk about eschatology, and one of the classes we'll have probably first year is systematic theology, and eschatology will be one of the things we study because it's one of the branches of theological study. Eschatology means the study of the end times, as is commonly called in Protestant circles, or the last things. It comes from the Greek word eschaton, which means last. And so eschatology is the theological study of where are we going? How's this thing, you know, what's the last chapter? How's God going to wrap all this up? Um, where, where are we headed to? And the reason I'm talking about that right now is because Human beings over time, and you may not be aware of this, we have had a very different kind of orientation toward how we feel about the future. And one of the correctives for some of the mistakes that humanity makes about the future is what does scripture say about the future? And in particular, you might be surprised to hear me say, what the prophets have to say about the future. Let me give you a little bit of a background here. Pre-modern society, and when you say pre-modern, you know, more ancient kind of thinking, uh, some people believe that this ended with the Enlightenment, so we're, we're talking about um, maybe 17th century or so, the ancient or pre-modern sort of culture of humanity ended. Pre-modern society gave priority primarily to the past. Where did you come from? This is why it used to be a much bigger deal who your parents were. You know, what family were you a part of? Um, that used to be the thing that completely dictated your future. Where you came from was the thing that, that completely controlled what your opportunities were in life, right? Yes. That's because pre-modern society looked more to where you came from. It looked more toward the past than it did toward either the present or the future. Well, along around the time of the Enlightenment, again, 17th century or so, depending upon where you want to draw the lines, some people differ, we came into the area of the time period which has been called modernity. Modernity, which lasted from, again, the Enlightenment, um, 17th century or so, up until either the 1950s, or some people would say the late 1980s. Um, modernity, basically with the, the, the threat of nuclear annihilation, after, you know, after the Second World War, or perhaps with the massive changes in information technology in the 80s, depending upon, again, who you ask. Modernity continued until then. And in modernity, there was a high priority given to the future. And not only to the future, but to this extraordinary opportunity that the future consisted of. The idea that science especially was going to cure all disease and was going to cause us all to be able to live forever and there was going to be no more poverty or war or difficulty and the, you know, the, the, my future is so bright I got of our shades, all right? And the future is just going to be glorious. That was the theme of modernity, which means you can under, understand why some people say that modernity, because that was sort of the understanding of it, that it ended with the nuclear threat of annihilation, that science had brought us to the point where we all could die in, the, in, the fla in a flash of light. Some other people say that modernity uh, continued until the 1980s because of the advent of, I don't think many of us even think about, the radical extent to which in the 1980s things changed. When I think about what I do now in terms of when I study or I prepare or I look for things, I almost, you know, it's fairly rare for me to put a, pull a book off a shelf unless there's a book that I'm following somewhat sequentially. Everything else is done online. Um, emails. And, you know, Carolyn and I were laughing about the fact we watched a TV show recently and there was this mail guy pushing a cart through the office and handing people envelopes with memos in it. And we're going, holy moly, do you remember that? And we did. 
But the radical changes that we have, both in information and media, and then also the, the fundamental difference in terms of people's hope for the future. Um, the end of modernity led to an era called the postmodern. And postmodernity has affected everything. It has affected literature. It has affected philosophy. It has affected sociology. It has even affected architecture. Postmodernity is based upon the idea that there is there's nothing for sure. Instead of this super optimism about the future, it is it has really led us to a place of fear and pessimism. Nothing is for sure except it's probably going to get worse. That's kind of the postmodern idea. A skepticism, even a foreboding about the future, and therefore a resultant emphasis on the present. When you get into literary analysis, for instance, my background is in my, my previous training was in communication theory, and so I've done a lot of reading in communication theory. And one of the things that postmodernity has done is it's removed any sense in which there is any such thing as meaning, at least effective meaning. Uh, you can never really know what an author meant, and therefore you can never really draw any conclusions from it. You, there's no such thing as, um, as truth anymore in postmodernity. Because everything's up for grabs. Nothing is for sure. And if you think you got it figured out, then that's a pretty sure sign you have it. When I say that it's affected even architecture, you know, we're, we, uh, we're from Seattle. Well, Seattle, they have the new EMP. Frank Gehry, who also did the Bilbao Museum in, in uh, Spain, it looks like. Did they just start throwing slabs of metal on this thing until they were done? You know, there's no structure to it. The, the very idea is there's no, um, there's no structure. They're, it, they're looking for an appearance as though there was no intentionality. You couldn't have planned it because nothing can be planned. And that's manifested itself in architecture and literature and a lot of other things. Some people think that that architecture is great. I personally think it's pretty ugly. Okay. I like corners and things like that. So, um, and yet, you, the extent to which postmodernity has affected everything, and it has given this sort of psychological malaise to modern culture because of this skepticism about what's coming next. And whatever it is, it's probably not going to be good. Exactly the opposite of what modernity is. In fact, postmodernity, unlike modernity, has stopped talking about the future so much and said the only thing we can deal with is what's well, so happening right now. So the focus has been very much more on the present. That's the way Western society has developed their thinking. Ken? Okay? The only thing, you know, you were talking about postmodernity and there being no meaning or structure or anything, and so you have stairways going nowhere or doors that open into nothing. Well, that was, that's Winchester's wife. Winchester. Right? <laughs> so, did, did you ask him if they did that with the foundation? No. <laughs> the church. Yeah, we're now being... <laughs> Actually, I will say this. I, I feel very good about where we are because on the one hand, the fact that we bought a building for the new church, that there was a building on it. That was an old love factory. It had been used in a dozen years. And, um, it, and yet, the structure that was there gave us an immediate ability to picture how it would be a church. Where the sanctuary would be, where the narthex would be, where the classes could be, where the outside garden would be, where the fellowship hall would be. It would have been very much more difficult to picture that if the building hadn't been there. Okay, So we really benefited from it being there. But then once we got it, we come to find out they had just poured a layer of concrete over the mud that is the, the soil in, um, in Roberis. When we started digging, into, and we had we did all the right things, soil samples and compression tests and all that, and when they did, they, they, the people said, okay, you got to dig this whole thing up and start again. And when we started breaking up the concrete, the water started seeping up from underneath. We ended up with these big pools, not from rain, but from what came from underneath. And the walls are not stable, therefore, and so we're looking at it going, this is great. We get to tear it all down and do it exactly the way we want it done instead of trying to make something out of what was already there, and we know it's going to be done right. But having had the building there in the first place allows us to have had a picture of what could happen. So I think it's positive in both directions. So okay, anyway, um, so I'm not pessimistic about that at all. <laughs> but in light of that, in light of how humanity looks at the future and how that has changed <clears throat> over time, and how currently there's a sense in which there isn't a reliable way to understand what's going to happen in the future, that it's dominant, it's predominantly skepti uh, skeptical. We come back and say scripture the Bible, God's word for us, and especially the Old Testament prophets tell us that God is in control of where history is headed and gives us a fairly specific picture, if we're able to interpret it, of what God's intentions are, of what he plans to have happen 
we neither need to have an, uh, an unqualified optimism about the future based upon, because the thing about modernity is it was all based upon human potential. It's what we are able to do with science and that sort of thing. Um, we, no longer, we no longer have that, but we can look at with, optimistically with what God is saying, but also the realistic presentation in Scripture, especially in the prophets, that there are, gonna, there are hard times ahead too. You know, it's all, not all sweetness and light, and it's all not, not all darkness and damnation. That there is a balance there. And that's, as you've read the prophets, and I'm doing this at the end because I want you to think about what you've learned in this, and as you go back and reread the prophets, which I'm sure you will many times in your life, <laughs> because it's worth it, then hopefully you'll get a sense in which these books help us have a right, even a godly perspective, of, of what we look forward to. There's a future here, okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit more specific terms. The prophets, as you know, spend most of their time proclaiming a broken covenant, the broken covenant, and pronouncing judgment of the broken covenant. You remember the three main points of the prophetic message, which is consistent. It's in, in toto, it completely, in the major prophets, and in some of the minor prophets, but certainly if you look at all the minor prophets as the Hebrews did as one book, the book of the Twelve, it's very, very much, all three of these points are there. One, you've broken the covenant, and you better repent and straighten up. Secondly, if you haven't repented, so judgment is coming, probably 90 to 95 percent of the prophets are based upon those two. The very word, you know, a prophetic statement, carries sort of a, a you know, a gloom to it, because there is judgment in that. But the third, while it is a minority, is still present, the smaller part is that the Old Testament prophets deal with the future restoration. The third point, after you've broken the covenant, you better repent, you haven't repented, there's judgment coming. The third one is, and yet, even in the midst of that judgment, there is to be a future restoration, a future healing, when God's kingdom will be, you know, grace will be restored and God's kingdom will be a place where, as Revelation 21 says, you know, God will be our God, we will be his people, he will live in our midst, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, there will be no more mourning or grieving or death. That's the restoration. Okay? And the prophets point to that. In fact, you read through the prophets, as you have, and you'll be rolling along with all of this condemnation and all the things that have been wrong and how bad it's going to be. And then right in the middle of that will pop up a completely diet, you know, you almost think, somebody must have added this later, because all of a sudden there's this one statement about, of hope of restoration, that God is a merciful God, that he wants the best for his people. And then I'll go back into, you know, the condemnation that the people are, are due because of how they've acted, what they've done, or not done, all right? Now, to help us understand that, I want to look, there are six different central issues that the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, deal with as predict predictive aspects, that is, how they look to the future. We talk about predictive prophecy, those are the places where the prophets really do predict the future. Okay, that's what we call predictive prophecy. Now, a prophet is not somebody that tells the future. A prophet is someone who speaks for God. They may sometimes, as part of that, tell the future. That's what we call predictive prophecy. But a prophet is simply one who speaks for God, who communicates God's word to the people. And so I want to talk for just a few minutes about the six uh, predictive aspects of the prophetic statements with regard to God's plans for the future. All right? The first one is the land. The basic promise that God had made to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants, which is all the Jewish people, was that I will be your God and you will be my people. That's the, that's the sort of absolute basic. You boil down the, the, the covenant, the Jewish covenant, the covenant between God and the Jewish people, and it is I will be your God and you will be my people. But as part of that, God said to Abraham, I will make you the father of a great nation and I will give you a land for your people to live on. That is the promised land, which we usually spell with capital letters. The reason we spell it with capital letters is this, a, this is a critical part of what God promised his people. He fulfilled that promise when, under Joshua's leadership, after the death of Moses, the Israelites went into the land of Canaan. They crossed the River Jordan miraculously, and the first city they came to was Jericho, but the whole process whereby they claimed the land, and they had to fight for it. You know, they had to earn it. But uh, at the same time, God promised it would be their land. And they maintained that land from about 1400 up until the final, the, the Babylonian exile, which is in 586. So for almost 900 years, 
they, uh, they had that piece of property, okay, or 800 years, 800 and some years. Um, and there was always the expectation that that would be the thing that they would return, because the land was part of the promise. The, the Jews were so, so discombobulated, they were so beside themselves by the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity because it took away everything they thought made them a people and made them the people of God. You know, God had promised that they had a land and took it away from them. God said, I will reside in your midst and I will prove that by living at the temple. The temple was destroyed. Okay, God said, this is how I want you to worship me, through the sacrificial system, with the destruction of the temple. The sacrificial system went away. Everything was gone. And yet, there is always the expectation, and as we've said several times, this started to be fulfilled in the 1940s for the Jewish people, with the, re the creation of the nation of Israel and the return of so many Jewish people there. Just in the last few years, there now are more Jews living inside the nation of Israel than any other one location around the world. Okay? There are more Jews there now and more coming all the time. The law of return it allows any Jewish person to come there and become a citizen without qualification, unless they're a Christian. If you're a Christian Jew, then that doesn't apply. They made an exception for that. Um, but this idea that the land is a fundamental part of God's future plan. This is where Zionism comes from. Zion is, um, is sort of a shorthand term for all of the, the promised land. It comes from the, the city of Zion, which is Jerusalem, uh, the city of David, but it, it has become a word that's used to represent the whole expectation that the Jewish people have for a return to the promised land. Okay, this is Zionism. So the land, that's one. The second aspect that we have to be aware of in terms of any predictive uh, view of the Old Testament prophets is the near view, far view phenomenon. Many of the prophecies, for instance, that, um, that we read in the prophets, they will talk about uh, destruction by the Assyrians in the north or the Babylonians in the southern kingdom of Judah, and those things happened. But some of the descriptions of the destruction are so much more expansive than that, you get, which, in, which are to include, for instance, not just the, Israel, the nation of Israel in the north or the nation of Judah in the south, but talk about destruction coming upon all of the peoples, you know, uh, the Edomites and the Ammonites and the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of the ites. And that didn't, you know, didn't happen in, in some cases, it did. the Edomites were pretty much gone, but some of those are, were not destroyed in that way. And so you're saying, okay, how does that work? There's also the idea of the return. They talk a lot about the return, and you will remember that to the Jews, return from exile is the definition of salvation. And return from exile, where are you returning to? The land. Okay. So this idea of return, and yet some of the descriptions of return seem much more cosmic than just a bunch of people parading back to a piece of property. There is the sense in which it, the, the Messiah comes into this. Now, are they talking about God returning to the midst of his people with the first coming of Jesus? Are they talking about the second coming of Jesus as being the return of the Messiah? You could read that several ways. When we talk about near view and far view, it means that in many of the prophetic statements in the prophets, they are they're dealing with a, kind of a short-term fulfillment, but there's always a suggestion that there's a much longer term. And one of the ways that you can uh, the, that you might understand that is when you stand and you look at mountains, and and there are, there are rows of mountains. You know, there are mountains that are closer, and then behind them, but still visible, there are other mountains, and behind them, there's still other mountains. So, but when you look at it from a distance, it ends up looking kind of flat. You can tell because of, you know, some are in front of others, which are closest, but you can't tell how far it is between the ones that are closest and the ones behind those and the ones behind those. In the same way, we look at the predictive uh, prophecies in the books of the prophets, and we can see that there's more layers than just what happened immediately, but we don't know how far apart from each other those are. Is it 10 years? Is it 100 years? Is it 10,000 years? We don't know. It's a very similar kind of thing, but in virtually every case, when we look at the predictive prophecy of what God's intention is for the future in the Old Testament prophets, we have to realize that there's a more immediate and then a more long term. There's a near view and a far view, and we have to hold that in balance and understand we don't, we don't know how long it's going to be until some of the far view things get, get. Some of them have been fulfilled since that time. Some of them have yet to be. The great day of the Lord is not yet here in terms of the full fulfillment of the kingdom. 
Okay, John? That just leads to the fact that, that they still speak to even our generation. Oh yeah, it's for us too. You know, this is for us. The reason we study the prophets isn't because we're, yeah, we're reading something that's for the Jews. We're still in the midst of this. We are part of this, you know, this process and this time. We are in the era, the messianic era. And that's when these things, when we're waiting for them to be fully, you know, finally fulfilled. All right, the third thing in terms of a central issue is conditional prophecy. What do I mean by that? There are quite a few places in the prophetic statements where God says he's going to do something, but it's conditional upon how the people respond to his warning, whether it actually is going to happen or not. For instance, um, in Jeremiah 18, it reads like this, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, or destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And it goes on. In other words, in some of the places where the prophets declare disaster, for instance, or even blessing, the, the, the fulfillment of that, or the extent of fulfillment of that, is conditional in some cases upon how the people respond to that warning. It's intended as a warning, and a warning means the people decide whether they're going to heed it or not. And so when we look at it, you can't just read, you know, read everything as black and white, when you have to be aware of the places in where, which God gives a conditional prophetic statement about what his intention is, okay? So that's something we have to factor in when we look at, at predictive prophecy as well. The fourth factor is figurative language. There are places where we don't know whether God is speaking about some miraculous literal future or where he is speaking figuratively. And I'll give you a, a particular example. Isaiah 11 says this, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Now, is God saying here that war is going to end, and this is a figurative analogy of that, or is he, talk, is he saying that, that all the carnivores are going to stop eating each other? Lions aren't going to look for small creatures to swallow anymore. Is that what he means? Or is this a, a poetic symbol? Because a lot of you know a lot of Old Testament is written either literally in poetry or in poetic language. We don't know, and because we don't know, we can't be too bold about that. We can't be too quick to say, "Oh, it absolutely means the lions are going to stop eating other animals." You know, maybe it's possible, but we don't know, and so we need to have a little humility before we interpret things too literally. Because figurative language was a strong part of how the Hebrews wrote. And there's no reason to believe God wouldn't, didn't use that as well. Again, that, those, pa those kinds of passages may mean there is going to be an end to human violence. That that's a symbol, a figurative symbol of the end of war and of oppression amongst people. Uh, doesn't mean that meat eaters are all of a sudden going to become vegetarians, necessarily. We don't know. All right? <coughs> or vegan even, I don't know. The fifth point is the relationship between the church and Israel. Um, because as God, the, the prophets were speaking for God to the Israelites about the nation of Israel. When I say Israelite here, I'm talking about Israel in the north, Judah in the south. The whole nation was called Israel. I sure wish they'd come up with a different name. The northern kingdom is very confusing. <laughs> you know, the northern kingdom of Israel, but everybody's Israel too. Um, when we talk about the relationship with Israel and the church, people read, read the passages, and in some cases it appears as though the church, that is the Christian church, the followers of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will fulfill the Old Testament prophecies with regard to Israel and therefore supplant it, replace it, that we are the new Israel. There are other places in which it seems to be indicating that, the, that there really are two covenants, you know, and I'm getting into theological areas here that some of you who have more understanding about the, like covenant theology and things like that might want to argue with me. I'm not going to get into that right now because I'm not proposing this as a theological direction, but just... Uh, is it possible that God's, you know, God's orientation toward Israel as a nation, because there are promises even in the book of Romans about God still has plans for the, for the Jewish people. Um, is, is there some sense in which there is a covenant, and a new covenant for us, an old covenant for them, and they're both still valid? Well, theologians argue about that. Or is there only one covenant and we fulfill the original promise of the covenant by the presence of Jesus in our lives or whatever? There, these are questions, and when we talk about future expectations and, and pre predictive prophecy, we have to be aware that there are serious questions. And theologians differ strongly about what is the nature of the relationship between the 
the nation of Israel as God's chosen people, and the church of Jesus Christ as those who have been, you know, Paul says we're grafted under that vine, that we are adopted into that family. And that's how we can, you know, we can be blessed, although God had promised a unique blessing to his chosen people. I swear I stand up here and I don't have, my, I'm getting eaten alive. <laughs> you know, I'm me like crazy. Uh, and number six. Uh, the nature of the future kingdom is one of the central issues we need, need to be aware of. Um, we are told that the future kingdom will have a Davidic king on the throne in Jerusalem. Is that a promise of only the first coming of Christ? Is it a declaration of the second coming of Christ, since he was the son of David, he was an heir to that throne? Is there an indication that there will be some other fulfillment that the Jewish people have a right to expect with regard to a Davidic king? Those are questions. Right? I'm inclined to think in total fulfillment uh, in the presence and person of Jesus. But those are things we have to be aware of. Okay, So I, I offer you these six particular issues or ways of thinking that we need to be aware of as we consider. Now, and how you think about these things really do change based upon what theological models that you, you, you accept or you, you find yourself agreeing with. For instance, when we talk about the relationship between Israel and the church, well, several of these do, but that one particularly gets into the issue of uh, millennialism. You know, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, panmillennial, which we've said before, panmillennial means all I know is it's all going to pan out in the end, right? <laughs> amillennial means because, because Revelation talks about a 1,000 year reign of Christ. Well, is that now that it's a reign of Jesus with those who, who believe in him who have died already, they're present with him in, in heaven? Does that mean that he's literally coming back and then there will be a thousand year reign before the final consummation of everything? Does it mean, you know, etc., etc.? So there are different theological models. And so when we start talking about these kinds of things, there are whole theologies built up about just different perceptions of those. And I'm not going to recommend particular ones to you at this point. I'm not even going to get into a lot more detail about that, except for you to understand that these issues are, we need to study them, think about them, pray about them, come to our own understanding of what we perceive in them based upon what we read in Scripture, but understand that there are differences. We also need to respect each other's differences. Because, uh, as I've said many, many times, I believe there's going to be a whole lot of foreheads popping in heaven. We're all going to be going, how did I miss that? Why didn't I get that? That was so, so obvious. Okay, I think we're all going to be. So we need some humility about these things. Finally, I would say, give you a couple of other suggestions in terms of guidelines for as you study all of Scripture, especially the Old Testament, and even more especially the prophets, because the prophets talk about um, you know, God's plan for the future. And the first one, which is related to this figurative language, is we need to always uh, remember not to overlook the poetic aspect, particularly of the Old Testament. That was the nature of the way the Hebrew writers uh, wrote. And that poetry is factored in. I mean, if you, want to, if you want to recognize the places in your Bible, for instance, where it's, it's literally written as poems, as poetry, then look at the places in the prophets, and Psalms and Proverbs and others, obviously, where the lines aren't just text like this, where it's broken up, you know, there's short passages. That means it was written as a poem. And if you look through your Bible, you find a lot of that. In fact, for me, whenever I put stuff on screens for study, for Bible study, whatever, a lot of the time, because I don't have room to have three words on every line, I have to take that poetry and turn it into prose. But I'm always aware of the fact that I'm, I'm in a little way, doing a violation to it because it was written in poetic form for a reason. Because there is a certain power, uh, significance to a poetic form, and that's the reason that God, why the Hebrews wrote that way, and the reason why God inspired the prophets and many of the others Yes. Many of the uh, present theologians today will even identify the prophets as poets. Mm -hmm. Brueggemann does that. Yeah. And he just he will call them poets. They're poetic writers, and so we have a lot of this poetic language, a lot of this figurative language, and we have to respect that. Okay, we can't just overlook that and think of it all as though it was a written history. And you'll remember, it's very hard for us to talk about history in reading the Old Testament because history as we understand it was not invented until the 5th century BC after all of the Old Testament was written. History as we think of history, which means sequential and, um, and uh, consistent, detail-oriented, and somewhat objective, that was invented by Herodotus in the 5th century BC. Okay, 
after the last of the Old Testament writing. They didn't perceive history the way we think of history. And so we, we have to have that awareness when we read the Old Testament. It is not history in the way we think of history. Um, that doesn't mean it's wrong or false or not true even, not valid. Um, it's extraordinarily valid and important, but not of the form that we're used to. Okay? A second principle I would offer to you is that um, we always need to focus on translating and applying not the specific detail of the prophetic messages so much as the broader theological principles. This is one of the reasons I hammered so much on what the broad messages were. Because you get buried in some of the detail, which some of it had to do particularly with aspects of the Jewish life, you know, and what God was saying about them. And you can get bogged down in that detail. And that's, we need to deal with the detail too. I'm not saying go pay attention to the detail. But we also need to be prepared uh, to step back and say, well, what's the big message here? What is it that God is communicating that was true not only for, you know, for the Jewish people in, is in the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah before the Assyrians attacked, before the Babylonians attacked, but what's still true today? What is the larger uh, picture, the larger message that, that was true for them today and is still true for me today? I don't have a huge fear of starving to death inside a fortified city because the Assyrians are outside. And yet there's aspects of those same messages that are for me today. And I need to be sensitive to what those larger images and, and messages are. Okay? And the third thing, the final thing I would say is, do not forget this near view, far view kind of idea. We need to never read the prophets or any of the Old Testament prophetic kind of materials, um, Daniel or even Revelation for that matter, the New Testament stuff, in terms of thinking that it is a two-dimensional thing. There's a, there's a, there's a three-dimensionality to it. There is a near view... A, a, a soon to be fulfilled aspect of it, but there is always, pretty much always, a, a third dimension. There is something else coming that will will complete the fulfillment of those those expectations. So that near view, sort of partial fulfillment, which is valid in itself, but always with also the long term view that will not ultimately, you know, the, the great prophecies of Scripture will not be fulfilled ultimately until we stand before the great throne of judgment in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Any questions about that or anything else? Do you want to take a break for 10 minutes before we take the test?